All right, the fourth in our series of conferences or lectures on this immortal combat. This fourth lecture is going to be on the role of the sacramentals. I'm going to read to you from the Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph 1667. Holy Mother Church has, moreover, instituted sacramentals. These are sacred signs which bear a resemblance to the sacraments. They signify effects, particularly of a spiritual nature, which are obtained through the intercession of the Church. By them, men are disposed to receive the chief effect of the sacrament, and various occasions in life were rendered holy. And so there are things we call sacramentals. Now, the next talk is going to be on the sacraments, right? The role of the seven sacraments. But this hour, I'm going to talk about the sacramentals. <clears throat> They're similar to the sacraments, but they are not the sacraments. They are something other than the sacraments. However, uh, the church has instituted these sacramentals. They are sacred signs which bear a resemblance to the sacraments. What do, they, what do they do? They're signs which affect what they signify. Now, actually, that's what a sacrament does. Sense perceptible signs which affects what they signify. In other words, in baptism, we have water. We pour water or immersion in water. That's sense perceptible. We can see it. We can taste it. We can feel it. Sense perceptible signs which affect, which make happen, what they signify. Baptism, cleansing. Regeneration, new life. Okay. A sacramental, very important. The seven sacraments are the seven major channels through which sanctifying grace is given to people. All right? We receive sanctifying grace through the seven sacraments. Now, as I said in the last hour, the amount, the degree of sanctifying grace we receive as an individual is directly proportional to our good disposition, to the degree that we are open, to the degree that we are perfected in charity, to the degree that we are well disposed, we receive sanctifying grace to that degree and to no other degree. In other words, you get what you're ready to get and no more. Those who live perpetually in mortal sin no sanctifying grace. They have to repent. They have to come back into a state of grace to receive grace. Okay? What do the sacramentals do? The sacramentals help us to be disposed to receive sanctifying grace. Now, you remember what sanctifying grace is. A sanctifying grace is a share in divine life. That's sanctifying grace. So, Sacramental. Examples of sacramentals. Holy water, uh, medals, holy medals, rosaries that are blessed, holy pictures that are blessed, statues that are blessed. Uh, a, um, a blessing of an abbot would be considered a sacramental. Exorcism. The rite of exorcism is a sacramental. Various blessings of places. When uh, the priest or deacon comes to bless your home, that's a sacramental. Blessings are sacramentals. Uh, did you know that you are called to be a blessing and to give blessings? To the degree that you are in union with Christ, to the degree that you are holy, you become a blessing. It was said of St. Francis of Assisi that he was not so much a man who prayed as a man who became a living prayer. Uh, we are called to go far beyond reciting some prayers. We are called to become a living praise of the glory of God. We are called to become a blessing, to be something beautiful for God. Uh, this is sacramental in nature. The sacramental principle, I alluded to it last night. You have matter, something, uh, water. Now we're going to, they're out... Uh, Barbara's amazing. They're out, they couldn't, they're getting barrels of water. I wouldn't have been surprised if they drove up a fire truck. <laughs> now, 
they, they went out and they bought all the salt, the salt that the local grocery store, cases and cases of, of salt. We're going we're to do a blessing of salt and water as an illustration, okay, of a, um, of a sacramental. All right. Two things, essentially, involved in a sacrament as well as a sacramental. Remembering that the sacraments and the sacramentals are not the same thing. The sacraments are the way we receive sanctifying grace. The sacramentals dispose us to receive sanctifying grace. They help. Now, in recent times, there a lot of bad things, a lot of good things have happened in the last 30, 40 years. Great things have happened in the church. The Second Vatican Council was a great blessing for the church. Uh, contrary to what some well-meaning people think. They think it brought in all kind of bad stuff. No, the Va Vatican Council and its 16 basic documents was a great blessing for the church and the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, the misapplication of it has been problematic. Uh, so an awful lot of people quote Vatican II or the spirit of Vatican II promoting all kinds of things Vatican II had nothing to do with. Easy to misconstrue things. Look, if you can misunderstand and misquote the Bible, you can certainly do it with a church document, and it's done all the time. So, very often we saw a movement to try to remove sacramental signs from the church. How many war stories I've heard about misguided pastors who took out the statue of the Blessed Mother in the church. They took out the crucifix. All this not good in plain English. Now, simplicity is good. <laughs> you know, you can go overboard, all right. But these sacramental signs, we, need, we are not disembodied spirits, right? We're human beings. We have a body as well as a spiritual dimension. Sense perceptible things are important for human beings. We are not angels. We need to see things. We need to hear things. We need to be able to encounter things at the level of sense. We need it. God knows we need it. The church knows we need it. Sacramentals help to fit the need. I'm going to just illustrate this principle of the sacramental principle. I've already done it. Let me do it again, though. When we bless water, water is a natural element, salt, oil, that's the matter. We bless it. The blessing is the form, the prayer, the words, okay? Same in a sacrament, baptism. I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You pour water. The form, the words. The matter, the, the water, okay? The Eucharist, too. Every sacrament has form and matter. Every sacramental has some form and some matter. Water the blessing, the prayer blessing, and so forth. Okay. Water, oil, and salt, through the history of the church, are common elements that have been used as sacramentals. I'm going to use those three to illustrate, to illustrate this. In this immortal combat, we have weapons. Now, when I was in the Army, we had lots of classes and spent lots of time learning about the different weapons that the United States Army had at its disposal. How is a soldier going to fight a war if he doesn't even know he has weapons, much less how to use them? The sacramentals are great weapons in this spiritual combat in which we are engaged. If I was an enemy of God, or just flat unenlightened, an, an unwitting enemy of God, not a conscious enemy, I might say something like this. Oh, do, get away, do away with that superstition. That we don't believe in holy water anymore. We don't believe in blessed salt anymore. We don't believe in exorcism anymore. We don't believe in rosaries and medals and all that stuff. That's pious nonsense. Maybe it's even idolatry. If I were the devil, I'd love to hear that kind of talk going on all over the world. Why? Because that is removing things that do violence to the enemy. 
St. Teresa of Avila, a doctor of the church, one of the 33 doctors of the church. Uh, if I have time later, I'll read a little passage from her when she's talking about the devil. She says, the devil, you tell me you're afraid of the devil? Well, you're Christians. Why on earth would you be afraid of the devil? And I'm going to say that again. I said it before. Don't, have, don't go looking for the devil under every rock. Sure, he exists. Sure, he's active in the affairs of men. He's subverting us, mostly by temptation. Remember what an angel is. Do you know what the word angel means? Messenger. The word angel means messenger. Now, their nature is pure spiritual beings. Their mission is, and that's what the word angel means. It speaks of their mission, their messenger. You know what a messenger does. Carries messages back and forth. The messages come as thoughts. They carry messages from God to us and from us to God. They are engaged in this spiritual combat at the level of thought, at the level of intellect and will. <clears throat> what is the devil and the demons? Fallen angels. They still have their faculties as angels. Are they messengers too? You better believe it. But the message they carry isn't good. I've had people tell me, sometimes, Father, I don't know what's wrong with me. Uh, even in church, I start having terrible thoughts. Uh, I'll be in church, and I'll, start, I'll have some terrible blasphemous thought or an impure thought. Right in church, how can that be? Uh, I, I hate it, but I must be a very perverse person. I said, do you ever think, now, sure, those certainly thought. Let me tell you, thoughts emanate from one of three places. They come from God. They come from the devil. They come from you. Now, most of them come from our own subconscious. But they can also come from God or they can come from the devil. Those three places. There is a battle going on at the level of thought. A battle between the good angels and the bad. There's a battle for minds and a battle for wills and hearts. It's a fierce, violent battle. Once St. Anthony of the desert saw this battle, God allowed him to see this battle raging in the air about him. It frightened him so badly that he exclaimed to God, don't ever let me see that again. <laughs> he did. And St. Anthony was no timid man when it came to crossing swords with the enemy. He did it for many, many years in, in, in very wild and woolly fashion. I mean, he, he saw things other people don't see. He wasn't timid about it, but he was terrified at the thought of it. That war for your mind, that war for the minds of our children, you can understand how this war is waged. The level of philosophy. You know, we're all philosophers. Everyone has a philosophy, even though they don't know it. They operate under certain basic philosophy. Unfortunately, the last several hundred years of Western history has exhibited a lot of bad philosophy. That bad philosophy has also crept its way into theology, and it's exhibited, been exhibited in some bad theology very frequently. A war for minds. You, a human mind is a precious thing, terrible thing to waste, terrible thing to become perverse, terrible thing to be enslaved. The battle between truth and lies. Now, most of the secular world thinks that the truth is relative. They think that the good is relative. Oh, if it's good for you, fine. If it's true for you, fine. But it might be the opposite for me. You know, they, they say, um, you know, these differences are good. Uh, they're good so long as they are, in fact, good. But if they are outside the circumference of the good into the darkness of evil, they're not good. They say, yeah, but you have to tolerate all things. No, I don't. I have to tolerate good. Anything in the circumference of the good, I've got to tolerate that. Now, the color of a person's skin, whatever it is, that's good. God created it. It has to be good. Uh, whatever language they speak, whatever their culture, you know, if you want to go on vacation, to California, fine. If you want to go to Florida, fine. If you want to go to the Upper Peninsula, fine. Those are all good things. That's up to you. You're free to do that. I have to tolerate all that. I can't be prejudiced or bigoted 
in any way, as long as it's inside the circumference of the good. But once it crosses the line into objective evil, I don't have to tolerate that if I do tolerate that. That is in a, that's not tolerance, that's permissiveness. And there is a very radical and essential difference between tolerance and permissiveness. Now this war wages between good and evil, truth and lies, light and darkness, life and death. And sometimes we seem helpless, helpless to do anything about it. I have encountered hundreds of people, very often young people, who are really wounded, emotionally wounded, and in the grip of the devil. Well, I'm not saying they're possessed by the devil. That's enormously rare. But I am saying they are seriously influenced to the point of being sick, to being enslaved, to being caught in bondage. Jesus says the man who sins becomes the slave of sin. And you better believe it. Ask a drug addict. Ask a prostitute. Say, why don't you get out? Why don't you just get out? Oh, I can't. I need the money. I'll give you all the money and give you a job and give you a house and do everything. Archbishop Fulton Sheen did that. He adopted a prostitute. She became a very holy woman. He supported her for her whole life. Not many people know about that. He would be criticized if they did know about it. Well, she became a saintly person because of is because of that great archbishop's kindness, but most of the time, you know, they don't have that kind of patron, that kind of mentor, and they'll say, well, I can't do it. And you know why they can't? Because they are in the grip of evil. Oh, it may come in the visible form of the pimp who says, I'll kill you if you try to run away. But it is the devil who holds the reins. He is the one who is, is behind it, believe you me, behind drug addiction and alcoholism, behind prostitution, behind all of these societal evils, there is a personified evil. And his name is the devil. He's smarter than you. And he's smarter than me. He's a fallen angel. And a member of a high choir in the hierarchy of angels. And God has allowed him to preserve his faculties as an angel. So don't try to beat him by your intellect. And, and don't think that you can even beat him with your will. You know, people make a mistake. Oh, I have a strong will. I just won't do that. I'll resist. You're dead meat in no time. <laughs> I have learned through hard, long experience that, yes, God's given us an intellect and it's ordained towards truth. We should keep it that way. He's given us a free will. And that has the good as its end. Absolutely. However, there are factors that come into play that battle for our freedom, that battle for our mind. We need help in this battle. I remember when I first came back to the church after 20 years uh, living in the world as a pagan. I, I don't know how else to put it. I lived like a pagan. And I was brought up Catholic and went to church, received all the sacraments. I had no excuses. Some people didn't have that advantage. They have an excuse. I didn't have any excuse. I had a good mother, good family, had a good upbringing, good sisters educated me when, in, in grammar school. I had a good start in life. But I went off because of my own sin. When I came back, you do not live for 20 years the way I did without very serious consequences, terrible woundedness. The devil had a very, very real hold on me. And even after I came back and went to confession, which was a big step, and I was a daily communicant for a matter of many, many months, even years, <clears throat> there was still a grip of evil. Now, I wasn't committing mortal sins. I wasn't doing anything that I shouldn't have been doing in that period of time. But there was a certain presence that hung on, and it really tormented me. Spirit of lust, spirit of cocaine, spirit of violence. These were the predominant ones. How to get rid of them? 
the sacramentals played a major role. When I went home to my mother's house after 20 years of living in the pagan world in Hollywood, I went home to my mom's little house. <clears throat> now, you've got to understand, my mom's little house in upstate New York was kind of like this place in microcosm. <clears throat> you went in there, and you encountered a vast array of crucifixes, statues, rosaries, Bibles of every description, my mother would get holy water by the barrel. <clears throat> Not no little plastic container. Man, she had so much holy water. Now, that place was like a sanctuary. I guarantee you that for the devil to go into that house, he took a beating. <laughs> oh, he got his pointy tail scorched. You better believe it. But, but did it keep him out, absolutely speaking? No, he came anyway. Why? Because his malice exceeds his fear of that pain that is visited upon him by the sacramentals, even the sacrament. Will the devil come into church even though the blessed sacrament's there? Oh, it caused him great pain, but he'll come. Will he come in there and uh, tempt people? Will he put, put impure thoughts in people's head right at mass? You better believe it. Oh, I've had hundreds of people tell me that. And they, they, get, they, get, they get almost psychotic. Some of them, about, they say, I'm, I, I, maybe I need exorcism. I know you don't. Well, what's wrong with me? I'm sick. I'm, you know, I have these terrible thoughts. I said, listen, do you ever think of it this way? Maybe they're not your thoughts. Well, what are you talking about? They're not my thoughts. They're, they're in my head. If they're not my thoughts, what are they doing in my head? You know how it is, um, you know, in the old days, you go to a movie, they have a movie projector, and it projects an image on the screen. I don't know if they, they probably don't do it that way anymore with the technology now, but, you know, in the old days, there was a movie project, it projects an image on a screen. The angels and fallen angels have the ability to project thoughts and images. Very often, something will come into your head totally foreign. I had a little old lady, 80-some years old, come to me one time and say, Oh, Father, I have the most horrible pornographic visions. <laughs> she never saw pornography in her entire life. She said, Maybe I, you think I'm going crazy? I said, no. I know exactly what's happening. You know, you're a good holy woman, and the devil's trying to disturb you. Tell him where to go. She did, and he did. The Bible tells us, resist the devil, and he will take flight. The devil is like a bully. He's a bully. When, now, I grew up in the streets of New York, and you always, there's always a bully in every neighborhood, sometimes more than one. We had our share of bullies. And when I was a kid, I was a very shy, skinny little kid, and I was, I mean, I was... Um, just open season, fair play for all the bullies. They picked on me every day coming home from school. I took a beating regularly. Uh, I did fight. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do anything. I was scared. I was shy. I was, really, I was a humble kid. Um, and then something happened to me. <laughs> and I remember the worst bully in the school at the Christmas party began to pick on me in front of this little girl that I liked. Now, that's one thing you don't want to do little boys or big ones, embarrass them in front of their girlfriends or whatever. Well, I just couldn't stand. And then he began to torment the girl, and I said something, you shouldn't do that, and, and he grabbed me. Well, the first time in my life, and I'm not bragging about this, it's not good, but I hauled off and clocked him one with a left hook, and down he went, and he began to bleed like a stuck pig, and he took off and left a blood trail that uh, you might see in the deer season in the Michigan woods. <laughs> All the way down the block, and, and I was scared. I thought maybe I killed him or something. And uh, he, he happened to have a piece of hard Christmas candy between his teeth. <laughs> and, and there was no, I didn't know that. But uh, there was you know, no give, so it broke his jaw. And um, he, he instantly went from lifetime bully. He'd always been the most obnoxious, horrible bully in the neighborhood. To, to a very meek and humble kid overnight. But, but I had to... See, what happened was, when, when you stand up to a bully, he runs. The devil is a bully, 
and don't you forget it. And the nature of bullies is that they're cowards. They operate by fear and intimidation. Now here's a fact. God is all-powerful. Here's another fact. God is your father. Here's another fact. You're in Jesus Christ. You live through him, with him, and in him. The devil is going to come at you in many, many ways through temptations, impure thoughts, the seduction of the world. He may even at times come at you in extraordinary ways. Those are ordinary ways. The devil comes at everybody in the way of temptation. And he knows your weakness. I don't care who you are. I don't care who you are. I, I know a nun, a religious sister, who told me that she had been tempted for 60 years against purity. She didn't give in, but she was tormented by it. Pornographic dreams, horrible things. Where'd they come from? She'd never seen things like that. She had no such images of that in her mind. She, she wasn't, uh, a, you know, the, the garbage in, garbage out thing. She'd never taken any of that in. So where'd it come from? It was projected in by the enemy. Now, that's the result of my experience. I know that can happen based upon their faculties as messengers, angels, good and bad. The good angels project good. The evil, evil. And so that's the ordinary way that this combat with the enemy takes place. Even in extraordinary ways. When I came back to the church after 20 years, living like a pagan, drug addict, violent, chasing fast women, fast cars, and fast money, catching up with all of the above, I came back a mess, an absolute moral mess. My soul was like a stinking swamp, I assure you. I came back, went to confession, that removed the guilt. But then the battle was on. They don't let go easily. It is a very vicious combat. And your soul and mine is what's at stake. I had extraordinary manifestations of the enemy. When someone says to me, especially in educated people, oh, please, don't give me that medieval nonsense about the devil. Now, I can answer them in an academic way. I re I'll never forget it when I came back and I was zealous for the faith and trying to go to mass every day, but I had no education. I hadn't gone to seminary yet. I remember a religious sister, a very liberal one, said to me, oh, you just don't understand. You have no education. And so I went off and got 10 years worth of it. Earned four university degrees, including a pontifical doctorate, came back and then said, oh, you're just too conservative. <laughs> I can answer those things but in an academic way. I know what the church teaches, and I know it absolutely, and, I, and, and nobody can talk me out of it. You know, that's just impossible. There's no way. I know the stuff, and I know it up one side and down the other, but I know it in another way, through personal experience. Uh, you try to tell me the devil doesn't exist, and I can tell you some personal stories that'll make your hair stand up that are absolutely true. Someone once said to me, ah, you believe in that stuff? So have you ever seen the devil? Yeah. Let me count the times and the ways. Oh, no, I mean, have you ever actually seen him? Yeah. Yeah. I've seen his malice. Oh, he can take visible form. Has many times. Is he pure spirit? Yes, he's an angel, fallen angel. Can he take, assume forms? Yeah. Can he use matter? Yes. Can he even affect illnesses in people? Yes. Angels and fallen angels can do that. They have a certain power over created matter. But don't be afraid of that. Don't be afraid of that. The only thing that you have to be afraid of is sin. Sin is like writing out a letter of permission and giving it to Satan. Say, sure. You can have permission, authority over me. That's what mortal sin does. Our children and grandchildren every day write out the letters of permission. Come on, Satan. Come on in. 
Sure, you can have me. You think you have to do that consciously? Not necessarily. All you got to do is live in mortal sin and refuse to repent. All you have to do is rot in impurity. All you have to do is engage in a sexually promiscuous lifestyle, not repent of it, just live that way day in and day out. You know what you're doing? You're inviting the devil to take over your house, and I mean you personally. That's what it can do. But if you don't do that, you've got the power because you have grace. When you live in a state of grace, you're living in God's friendship, and the power of God works through you. One of the worst things that, you know, I'll give you an analogy from military operations. Some time ago, the military deduced that it is better, in a sense, to wound a man than kill a man. And the reason is that if you wound a man, it takes several other men to take care of that man. You kill him, well, he's out of there. He's not going to kill you back. Well, that's all right, too. But if you can incapacitate him, wound him, you neutralize him. And then you've got to have three, four guys taking care of him. Most of the church has been neutralized. Most of the people of God have been neutralized in one way or another. And if you're dead in mortal sin, you've been neutralized. You've got no power. And it takes a bunch of us just to keep you out of hell. The devil wants you to die in mortal sin. Oh, I, if someday it will be revealed to me how much my mother, my father, my grandmother, my aunts and uncles did for me. I could have died so many times. I mean, I could tell you stories driving my Ferrari 150 miles an hour between Los Angeles and Las Vegas with a very well-known actress sitting in the passenger seat with a briefcase in my trunk with about a kilo of cocaine. It was going to be quite a weekend. The highway patrol clocked me at 150 and came after me. They couldn't catch me, so they set up a roadblock. I didn't know they were chasing me. I would have stopped. They set up a roadblock. That's, I stopped for that. I, I, I'll never forget it. I, I thought, this is it. I'm going to the big house. Got out of the car. Let me see, license, registration. Open the hood. And, of course, immediately I'm thinking, open the trunk. No, open the engine compartment. Seven California Highway Patrol guys gathered around the engine compartment and were ooing and eyeing, asking me technical questions about how fast this mother goes. You tell me there isn't a God in heaven? My guardian angel will be highly decorated. Oh, is it fuel injected? How many carburetors does it have? How many horsepower? This actress is sitting there in the passenger seat, absolutely white as a sheet, scared half to death, going to be in the newspapers the next day. She knew what was in the trunk. The sergeant says to me, all right, he says, um, now you have to be careful. I don't want you driving that fast. That's dangerous. Now go ahead and be on your way. He didn't even give me a warning. I can tell you times where I've had guns in my face. I've been shot at. I... I, all 20 years living with one foot in hell and the other one on a banana peel. <laughs> my grandmother and my mother praying the rosary. You know, and who, else, no, who knows who else, right? Maybe some of you. <laughs> Protecting me. Our lady always protected me. So I go home to my mother's house, the sacramentals. Holy water. Holy water is a great thing. Now, I'm going to use, we have a new, short, simple form of blessing for holy water. It's found in the sacramentary in the Book of Blessings. I use it. I use it. I'm going to give you an example, though, of a sacramental blessing from the Roman ritual, from the old Roman ritual, so that you know what holy water is about. Now, I don't know where it, where it is. Where's the holy water? 
Where are the, where's all the water and salt that I'm supposed to do? Uh, where is it? Over there? Oh. Yeah. Okay, well. <laughs> I will work around that then. Uh, <clears throat> When, uh, all right, let me reiterate about this sacramental principle as how it applies to sacramentals. Holy water or salt. We've got that material, water, salt, oil, whatever it may be. You say a prayer. That prayer, that blessing, attaches to the material, in a manner of speaking, spiritually. Wherever you sprinkle the holy water, that prayer or blessing is placed. Wherever you sprinkle the blessed salt, the blessing, the prayer is placed. Okay? The effect that it has on the enemy is violent. Now, there is a reverse, a flip side of that principle. Every witch, every warlock, every satanic priest knows all about the sacramental principle. Because they have used that, the flip side of it, for centuries, back into the beginnings of time. The devil apes God. He mimics God. And there is, for some reason, God permits this. I mentioned to you last evening, I knew a major, major drug dealer in Los Angeles. He would get in huge shipments on, on boats, on big ships. I'm talking about tons of pure cocaine. His first act was to get a satanic priest in to curse it and to protect the shipment and all his men. Oh, and the incantations they used, they invoked, you know how we invoke the protection of the angels and saints? They invoked the protection of specific demons by name to protect us from bullets, to protect us from police intervention. To protect, they're just like litanies. And then the curse. And anyone who uses this element, cocaine, may they be afflicted, body and mind. Uh, may their mind be weakened. May they be open to all the powers and influences of the evil one. On and on and on. Frightening. And some would say, ah, hogwash, superstition. An awful lot of priests and bishops and theologians would say, yeah, that's just nonsense. That's just superstition. My grandfather, my great-grandfather were carpenters. I remember my grandfather one day saying he, 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 uh, he had a man, new man on the job, and he watched him, and he had an apprentice. He tried to train him, and the guy didn't know how to saw a board straight. He didn't know how to pound a nail. And at one point, this is my great-grandfather, and he said, uh, said to him, Sonny, either learn your trade or get another one. To some of these priests, bishops, and theologians who don't understand a silly thing about the most rudimentary elements of what we're talking about, Sonny, get another trade, because you don't know which way is up. <laughs> or else learn your trade. The people of God have suffered horribly, horribly, because there is no one to lead them or protect them. Now, there are exceptions. There are many good priests, many good bishops, many good theologians. But unfortunately, the number of bad ones in recent times is legion, absolutely legion. They have been neutralized. Do you know what happens when you no longer believe what the church believes? Do you know what heresy is? I'm going to give you the definition right out of the catechism. Heresy is an obstinate post-baptismal denial of some element of faith or morals which must be accepted with divine and Catholic faith or an obstinate doubt concerning same. Do you know what the immediate and automatic penalty for heresy is? Excommunication. And it doesn't require the act of a bishop. It, all it requires that, that you know it. You know, you know you are defying church teaching, and many of them know it. What happens? You're cut off. You're a dead member of the body of Christ, and dead things.
transmit no life to anything. And that goes a long way to explaining what's going on. They've been neutralized. They are soldiers who have been fatally wounded, taken out of the battle. And who knows how many other of us are called to keep them alive, so to speak, so that they don't die and go to hell. How many elderly people in their sufferings, in their rosary, in their prayer, are keeping some of these guys alive? They kept me alive. But I tell you, I was neutralized for 20 years. And, I, and a lot of other people, a lot of the grace that came from their prayers and good works was used to keep me alive. I assure you, I'd have been dead and in hell without it. And so it took a lot of people to keep me going. And it takes a lot of us to keep some of the others going. You don't want to be neutralized. You don't want to live in sin. You want to be strong. The sacramentals help. Holy water has been used throughout the history of the church in order to bless things, to sanctify them, and for protection. Now, I, I just, I'm going to bless the stuff later, but I'm not going to wait. I've got to do this for this particular talk because we're going to run... We're going to run out of time. I'm going to read to you from the old Roman ritual, the rite for providing holy water. And just listen to this. And remember what I told you about that principle, that the material, the water, the salt, whatever it is, that material receives that blessing. It attaches to it. And then wherever you sprinkle the water, the salt, whatever, that prayer is placed. <laughs> now listen to the blessing. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. God's creature salt, I cast out the demon from you, and I'm going to make the signs of the cross that were called for in the ritual. I cast out the demon from you by the living God, by the true God, by the holy God, by God who ordered you to be thrown into the water spring by Lysias to heal it of its barrenness. May you be a purified salt a means of health for those who believe, a medicine for body and soul for all who make use of you. May all evil fancies of the foul fiend as malice and cunning be driven afar from the place where you are sprinkled. And let every unclean spirit be repulsed by him who is coming to judge both the living and the dead and the world by fire. Almighty and everlasting God, we humbly appeal to your mercy and goodness to graciously bless this creature's salt, which you have given for mankind's use. May all who use it find in it a remedy for body and soul, and may everything that it touches or sprinkles be freed from uncleanness and any influence of the evil spirit through Christ our Lord. And then there's an exorcism of the water, and then the salt and the water are mixed together. But the language of the blessing, listen to it. It's an exorcism. Now, where that water or salt is placed, what happened? That prayer is placed. That exorcism prayer, prayer is placed. Can the devil still come in? Yeah. Can there still be all kinds of evil influences? Yeah, but it's going to cost them. It's going to cost them big time. And you might as well make them pay. You know? And, and I'll tell you, it lessens the power of evil. There are factors which can increase or lessen the power of evil in a place or in a person. I'll give you an example. A person, let's say, this is very common. They begin in school, let's say uh, junior high school. You know, the natural course of things you know, girls start to notice boys, and boys start to notice girls. And with the culture we have, promiscuity is facilitated. It's glorified in the movies, the movie stars, the rock star. And so sexual promiscuity becomes normative. In eighth grade, oh, you better believe it. If you think otherwise, you are very, 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 very wrong. Today in our country, more than 50% of teenagers have had sex before they reach the age of 18. That's a fact. That's just a fact. They admit it. I'm not blaming them, but I am blaming the culture. It facilitates evil. So let's say, hey, 
I just, they, the, the young man, the young girl, she's, we just do, we're not doing anything bad. We're just doing what all of our friends do. And they don't have a profound influence of the church, most of them in their lives. So they're not protected at all. So they begin to sin. And then one thing leads to the other. Maybe at a party, of course, they become acquainted with alcohol pretty early. Then maybe someone introduces marijuana. And then if they're in certain areas, and it doesn't mean you have to be in a big city. I've been in small towns where you can get methamphetamine or cocaine on any street corner. And so maybe at a party, some enterprising young man has little packets of cocaine or speed, and, you know, people start trying it. And what does it do? It has an effect, especially those speedy drugs. It has an effect, and even uh, marijuana, it'll have an effect of, quote, loosening you up like alcohol. You will do things that you wouldn't normally do. And so though they started with sex. Now they're doing really perverse things. By the time they're 21, it's right out of a porno movie. And then maybe they're starting to get involved with the occult. I can tell you that there are a great many of witches' covens and satanic, quote, churches who use drugs and sex to lure in unsuspecting prospective members into the church of Satan or into witchcraft. I can tell you that Hollywood, Los Angeles, San Francisco, permeated with it, saturated with it. The high priest and founder of the Church of Satan in the United States, Anton LaVey, had a big house in San Francisco. Thousands of people get drawn into this. They don't really know what they're getting into until it's too late. This is real. Now, I can just hear the voices. You know, I'm, I'm looking at the video cameras here and all the, the CD things and the audio, everything. That, you know, I'm being re recorded for posterity. I want to tell you, I got a lot of guts. <laughs> I think about it and I say, man, this is going to go out there and these guys are going to take one look at that they're going to be infuriated. And I don't mean just angered. I mean infuriated with all the malice of the devil who will use them. You know, I've been threatened for years. Oh, we're going to take away your faculties. We're going to do that. Make my day. I'll go on as long as the Lord lets me go on. When he says, that's it, your hour has come, I'll spend a lot more time fishing. You know? What happened after the Lord left? You know, the, the Lord uh, died, put him in the tomb. Peter went fishing. <laughs> and the Lord appeared to them, remember? Appeared to them in the boat, you know? So he, you know, even if we, you get shut down, probably the Lord will resuscitate you. And you're not going to get out of it that easy. People are always telling me that, oh, no, you're not getting out of it that easy. You'll be around for a while. Probably will. In any event, these sacramentals are efficacious because they carry with them the prayer of the church. They don't convey sanctifying grace like a sacrament per se. However, they convey the prayers of the church. They convey the blessings of the church. And they operate, unlike the sacraments, which operate in virtue of their own power, they operate in virtue of the disposition of the one receiving or using the sacramental. In other words, if you are a person of great faith and piety, your use of holy water is going to be more powerful than someone else who doesn't really believe it. You see, the efficaciousness of it is somewhat dependent upon the person using it. But the prayer is there. You sprinkle the holy water, it's there. The blessing is there. Uh, I've gone to many so-called haunted houses. People have all kind of goofy notions. Oh, there are uh, ghosts in my house. Now, there's no such thing as a ghost. But there's such a thing as a demon. There's such a thing as the devil. And many of these preternatural occurrences that happen, you see it in the movie, many of it's nonsense. It's, a lot of it's nonsense. Figment of somebody's wild imagination. But some of it is very true. It is not all nonsense. Can the enemy influence objects? Can they have an effect on objects, things, places? Yes. 
Absolutely, yeah. Why would the Roman ritual have an exorcism for a place if the enemy can't influence a place? Oh, yes, it's very real. But do not, I repeat, do not be frightened by the enemy. Do not go. A lot of people are, are they become, what's the right word, intimidated. They, they, they go overboard. Let's put a crucifix in every window and in every doorway and do this and do that. And that. The most profound experience I ever had concerning the enemy was a real malicious, violent, physical and spiritual attack that happened to me. I had no holy water. I had no rosary. I had no blessed crucifix. Devil grabbed me. And from the center of my soul, the Holy Spirit rose up like a lion. Imagine that you had a lion living in the center of your being. Like, a, you know, we have watchdogs. I have a watchdog. My, my dog says he's a pretty good watchdog. He's about 100 pounds worth. And, and uh, he's a real good watchdog. Imagine if you had a lion. <clears throat> that lion lived inside of you. And he was your spiritual watch lion. You know, the, one of the names for Jesus is Lion of the Tribe of Judah. That lion... Holy Spirit, Spirit of Jesus, rose up from within me, grabbed Satan, and rolled him up like a little ball and fired him into hell. And the power, the awesome power of God and the insignificant audacity of the devil were revealed for what they really are. You are a child of God. And so long as you live in his grace, you don't have anything to be afraid of. It is unbecoming for a child of God to be afraid of the enemy. Don't worry about it. Now, many, many people, I have known many people who came from the same place I did. They were drug addicted. They were alcoholics. They were addicted to pornography, sex, all kind of perverse things. Many homosexuals have tried to get out, and there are perverse demonic spirits which attach to all of these things and they do not let go easily you need help you can't do it yourself you need the sacraments you need the sacramentals you need to repent holy water helps loosen the grip blessed salt will help loosen the grip of the enemy I, I have a good friend who's a very simple laywoman and God has moved her to run a shelter in a kind of a rehab place for drug addicts. Now, she's not permitted to promote religion directly uh, because she gets funds, you know, to, from the government for this. So she, she, can, she can do social work. Uh, she can do rehab work, um, you know, of a, of a psychological nature. She has a staff, psychologist, so on. In the kitchen, they make the food for volunteers. Big pot of soup. Guess what one of the ingredients is. <laughs> oh, let's see. We have uh, three teaspoons of blessed salt, and we have a gallon of holy water, and we have some carrots. She's got green scapulars buried in the cushions of all the chairs at the dinner table. Got scapulars in all their pillows. What happens? Well, what happens is these prayers are placed. Can you imagine a person who's obsessed or even possessed by the devil and they're, and they're taking in holy water, blessed salt? That prayer is being taken into their very body. Now, I'm not saying that has a, an immediate and total effect of wiping out the enemy, but neither does napalm. But I'll guarantee you it has some effect. You know, you want to burn out the devil, use the weapons that we have been given. That is the sacramentals. They help us. They are weapons. We use them. Use them. It is the devil himself that has tried to do away with all of these efficacious signs of God working in our midst. 
So you keep your blessed medals and your scapulars, your blessed rosaries, your statues, your crucifixes. You have holy water. You use it and use it with faith. We are not superstitious people, but we are people who believe in the mystical power of the things that God has given us. And anyone who wants to contest this, I have here the Catechism of the Catholic Church, a sure norm for teaching the faith. And you've got to have a pretty wild imagination to get around that. And it speaks about the sacramental as our weapons, powerful weapons. I'm going to bless the, uh, the water and the salt. What are we doing, Barbara? Yep. Okay, that's what we're going to do. We're going to conclude this lecture right now. We're going to go have lunch, and then uh, kind of as a separate thing, we'll do the blessing of the uh, salt and water. God bless you.